Okay, we'll go ahead and get started on higher education. First bill is House Bill 131. And Representative Clark, just briefly go over it. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I bring for your consideration House Bill 131. This bill gives the same advantage to the final grade to students in dual enrollment in college classes as is given to those students who take advanced placement classes in their high school. AP or advanced placement classes are college level courses that a student can take in high school taught by a trained and usually an excellent high school teacher. They were created by the College Board and it offers college level curriculum and examinations to high school students. Typically, the school offers these courses to students who are in honors programs or who have completed all their high school requirements in, in an available subject. The courses are rigorous. They're more rigorous than regular high school classes since they are, in fact, college classes. Students can receive college credit for taking the courses and um, for receiving a, a certain grade on a final exam, uh, although not all college classes grant credit to these AP classes. Because these classes are more rigorous, uh, the school system often rewards students for taking them with an added bonus to their final grade. For example, Gwinnett County gives 10 points for the final grade of an AP class. If your final grade um, representative, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Representative uh, Williams, if your final grade is a 97 in AP German, you would receive a 107 on your final grade report. And this 107 gives you a tremendous advantage when you're vying for honors as valedictorian or salutatorian. Just as Gwinnett gives 10 points, Cobb gives five points, and other systems give their own point value to AP classes. So this final grade doesn't have anything to do with the AP exam now, because this exam comes, this exam grade comes in the summer. This is the score that is given by the, um, by the high school teacher. So because I think so much of this committee, I am going to uh, make lines 22 through 106 very concise. And uh, it has to do with the Georgia Student Finance Commission and how they uh, score for HOPE uh, scholarships. When you complete your AP class, the Georgia Student Finance Commission takes the unweighted grades. So if you got your 107 uh, in, in German again, it goes back to your 97 and it equates to a, a 4.0 system. So your 97 would be a 4.0. Uh, if you, um, let's see, if then it adds a 0.5 to that grade point average. So, for example, if you received Chairman Rogers an 88 in your math class, you would have a 3.0, but the Georgia Student Finance Commission would add a 0.5 to that, and in looking at this for your HOPE scholarship, you would then have a 3.5. Now let's talk about dual enrollment. Dual enrollment is defined as taking a college class while you're in high school, counts toward your high school grade and a college grade. You earn your Carnegie unit in high school in addition to your college grade. But a student taking a dual enrollment class taught by a college professor from an accredited college or university does not receive .5 added to his average, even though it's a bona fide college class taught in approved, uh, in approved post-secondary setting. Also, these students do not receive the weighting of a final grade, which counts towards their high school average. A student who receives an 85 in the college class keeps the 85 on his high school transcript. A student with an 85 in an AP class receives as much as a 95 on their transcript in some school systems. The AP student most often receives this final grade without the addition of the AP exam. This exam score is returned uh, it, again, in midsummer, the dual enrollment score is based on coursework plus a final exam and does not receive any extra bonus grades. There are school systems that do not offer AP classes and they're at a disadvantage for their HOPE average. Not all colleges offer credit for AP classes. They're more inclined perhaps to offer uh, credit for classes actually taken at an accredited university or college. Students are given a choice of learning settings with an equal advantage if, this is, if you would support this bill today. Uh, 
So House Bill 131 proposes that students in academic dual enrollment classes receive a .5 from the Georgia Student Finance Commission added to their final class average for college classes taken at approved institutions. To receive a credit advantage, the courses must be in core subjects from an accredited college and must be approved by the Georgia Student Finance Commission. And if approved, the college class would not only count toward the HOPE average, but would also receive the same .5 advantage for a challenging class of a college level material taught by a college level instructor. Students that do in dual enrollment are disadvantaged, even though they're taking the same level coursework as the AP classes taught in their high schools, they're not receiving the .5 toward HOPE scholarship. This bill has been approved by the Governor's Education Advisors and also it's, it is um, supported because students have not been taking advantage of dual enrollment in the numbers we thought they would. So this advantage may encourage uh, young people to take advantage of uh, dual enrollment. And uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Uh, Tracy Ireland to talk about the financial aspect of this bill. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the committee for the representative? Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. Um, we have estimated the impact of this bill on the cost of the HOPE Scholarship Program and estimate it to be approximately $450,000 to $550,000 per year. I wondered if you would identify yourself and who the we is you're talking to. Um, I beg your pardon. I'm Tracy Ireland. I'm with the Georgia Student Finance Commission. I presently serve as Vice President of Student Aid Services there. And he is president to be Friday, right? That's correct. Yes, sir. He will be your new president of Georgia Student Finance. Okay. Representative Watson. Uh, if, if, and this may be uh, for for the president-elect there. The, uh, this was not taken away in the hope fix there two years ago, correct? That's correct, sir. HB 326 did not do that. Okay, so this is never, the dual enrollment has never been considered in the past. So Cor we're adding that. Correct. Okay, and uh, thank you. Okay, Representative Gardner. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Does it, do, um, Classes at a technical college count? For the waiting on the dual enrollment coursework? Mm -hmm. They would if the, they would if they are um, Representative, you need kind of the mic since we're streamed. Mr. Chairman, I'm so sorry. They would representative if they are commensurate with advanced placement classes. It would be the um, the the uh, Georgia Student Finance Commission, which makes that decision if they're commensurate with those advanced placement classes. There's the possibility, but most likely they would be college classes. And they could be technical college classes if they were if approved they were by the yes, Georgia yes, Student Finance. Yes. Just, uh, just for my own clarification, uh, the dual enrollment courses are, is a student permitted just to take any course that's offered at a, in a college campus or are there certain courses designated for dual enrollment? There are certain courses designated for dual enrollment and the Georgia Student Finance Commission again would set the rules as to those that would receive the point five they would be commensurate with advanced placement. And, and, and so the courses are taught even though they are pre-approved for dual enrollment, they are taught still at college level. Yes, there are college students in the class. The, they are in the class. Yes, okay. the, the, the students are just mixed in with a regular college class. Okay. Okay. It is not separate or a, a separate class for them. Our representative Garner has got another question for you. Well, the other question I have is I remember when we changed the hope a few years ago and added a significant burden to the responsibilities of the student finance um, folks and just wondered whether they have the staff to do all this uh, approval. Thank you for the question. We, we do. You do? Oh, yes, ma'am. We, 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 if you're re referring to the selection of the courses and that sort of thing, we work with the university system along with the Department of Education in determining those courses that match up. Okay. Representative Mabry had a question for you. Thank you, Chairman. What issue are we trying to resolve here with this bill? Uh, maybe I'm missing it. 
don't understand uh, and I know about hope and the AP courses just got done with high school not too long ago but what issue are we trying to resolve here thank you the folks that um, worked on the hope grant feel as if perhaps this was omitted that dual enrollment is one that is commensurate with advanced placement classes and um, also they have noticed that dual enrollment students are not in the numbers they projected them to be so they're hoping that this will encourage more students to take advantage of dual enrollment <coughs> at this point advanced placement classes get a, a bonus of a 0.5 and we're hoping that these students will get the same bonus who is 26 this you Ruffin Watson Thank you. Just uh, just for point of clarification, core uh, courses, math, science, and social studies, and English. So, but not it's not going to be art and college and so yes, forth. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. It would be those core. Right. Courses. right. Those are the core courses. Yes, sir. And the approximate if we increase the enrollment. So, where are we now, and where will we be by allowing dual enrollment? In other words, kids who are in college classes now. What are the numbers now, and where would we like to be, and how much is it going to cost? Hope, hope, uh, you can answer the hope uh, process. I guess the money on this. Approximately um, 5,000 students uh, receive a dual enrollment award now through the Excel program. That program is funded by state general funds. We think that there could be a increase, an increase in the usage of Excel based on this bill. Uh, on the HOPE side, the impact is estimated, as I mentioned, to be about four hundred and fifty to five hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. When you look at the number of students who could be affected by that increase or that point five weighting on the on the uh, dual enrollment coursework, Tracy, the uh, the lottery itself, the funding has come up. Isn't that correct? And the reserves are up as well. That is correct. Sir. Okay. Okay. Number twenty eight. Is that Representative Mabry again? Yes. Sir. Okay. I thought you, you're new, aren't you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, wanted to find out what is the university and colleges take on this? Only issue is so you got college students that are in classes, and now we got dual enrollment people. And so I wanted to hear if anyone could chime in what the colleges and universities have to say about this program. Have, um, Dr. Susanna Baxter with the Georgia Independent College Association. Okay. I can't speak, speak for everyone, but for our member colleges uh, and for the Complete College Georgia Initiative, our hope is to get students in the pipeline and out in a timely manner. And what happens with AP courses in a number of our schools is that the students just simply don't make the final grade of a four that's needed for it to count. So there are a lot of students who take that higher level course and get a three, and then the college can't do anything with that credit. This would mean if that student makes the grade just alongside all the other college students, that grade counts in those core classes. That grade will count and they're that much closer to enrollment or, or to graduation. So from our membership perspective, we are a big fan of this because we think it will help get students through the pipeline in a timely manner. May I add that House Bill 186 from last session, which was uh, carried by uh, Chairman Carter was uh, uh, to have a seamless um, uh, way through school and have students in high school taking college classes and and again as um, she said to have students go through quickly and uh, seamlessly and and I, I might add that um, Mr. Ireland you mentioned that that was a fraction of a percentage of what it costs for the HOPE grant so it sounds like a great deal of money, but it is a very small amount in the big picture of the HOPE grant. Okay. Okay, uh, Chairman Casas. Just curious, uh, being a, a former AP teacher, have, <laughs> as we taught those courses and we got the, the students prepared for that final test, that test is very rigorous. Yes. Are we ex expecting the same rigor? I'm, I'm going back to that question with the dual. We're expecting the same rigor. These are SACS certified colleges. So, so you're, again, you're matching them, right? Yes, you're, and you're, the exam for the uh, advanced placement does not count in this HOPE grade. 
So that final oh, okay. exam does not count in the whole grade. I see. So it's only the grade. All. It is the grade given by the high school teacher. I see. Very good question. Okay. Uh, is that you, Representative Watson, again? I was going to make a motion at the okay. appropriate time. There is one more question, John, uh, Representative Piso. I have a question. When uh, when a student is, is enrolled in, in dual, dual enrollment classes, are they paying tuition to the university where they're taking? Yes, they are. And there, you might mention there is a grant, so I'll let Mr. Ireland. The, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Excel program pays the full tuition amount at a public institution. Okay. Thank you. The Excel program does. Hope does not. Okay. Uh, Representative Watson. At the appropriate time, which seems like now, we'll make a motion that this do pass. And um, if we have an amendment, is now the time to. Yeah. Um, Got a motion. Uh, here, second. second. Okay. Further discussion? There is an amendment in front of you. I don't know, Tracy, if you've seen it or not, but. Uh, it should be okay. I know uh, Representative Clark and I talked about it, and um, it is at the option of the uh, Georgia Student Finance Commission if a student applies individually for uh, the waiver. So, well, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody has an explanation of the amendment. Is there any questions? If not, uh, do I hear a motion on the amendment? Uh, got a, we got a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. On House Bill 131 as amended, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, like sign. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Representative Mr. Clark. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Chairman Dollar, you're next. And if you can do it a little bit quicker, I would appreciate it. So. You're not a retired uh, school teacher or principal, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, today we're looking at uh, HB 324. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was contacted by a constituent who had um, uh, twin seniors getting ready to go off to school, both Zell Miller uh, scholars. One was going to Kennesaw, the other to UGA. And uh, they were getting some conflicting stories about what was required of them. Uh, the one at Kennesaw, uh, was reporting that they did not need to fill out this um, this FAFSA form, uh, and UGA was telling them that they that they did require, it. and this was a a new it, the way it came to us was it was a new law that was passed, and w really in effect what was happening was this is a uh, this came about as a result of a law we passed a few years ago, uh, saying that uh, state benefits uh, in this case the Hope Scholarship could not go to um, uh, people who were not uh, legal residents or citizens. And uh, this was a, uh, a rule that, uh, well, I called Georgia Student Finance Commission and they said, well, the one, the UGA was reporting it correctly because this is sub stuff that was just being uh, sent out to the institutions that was going to be required of, of, of all Hope Scholars, not just the, um, the Zell Miller Scholars. Um, and the, the form that they were choosing to uh, use to verify uh, citizenship um, or legal residency was this FAFSA form. Uh, uh, the constituent was not happy, and uh, I could understand why. It's a fairly uh, lengthy form, and uh, in all honesty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, invasive. It does ask you uh, income. It asks you a lot of information about um, assets, so on. Um, so after some discussion, um, when the law was passed, we exempted the regents, uh, the technical colleges and the uh, university system. And the reason we did that was because they were already um, required under federal law to collect this information and to verify to verify this. So uh, what this bill is doing, it, it is allowing the uh, Georgia Student Finance Commission uh, to, um, which they already can do, uh, to communicate directly with the universities to um, verify citizenship. And uh, furthermore, um, on top of that, on top of that, there's also the failsafe of an audit, which Georgia Student Finance Commission conducts every year, um, uh, and every institution uh, gets audited at least every three years. Uh, the ones that they need to keep a closer eye on, uh, uh, more common audits. Um, and if it's found that a student, um, in I guess, incorrectly receives hope, the institution uh, would be on the hook for that. Um, 
and kind of to take this one step further, uh, not only do Hope Scholars now required to fill this form out, um, but they're going to be under the current law, if we don't pass this, they'll be required to fill this out every year. Um, so this is going to be a, a, a large burden, not just on the students and the families, uh, but on the Georgia Student Finance Commission as well, collecting um, in the neighborhood of 210 to 215,000 uh, of these. Chairman Knight has a question for you. Chairman Knight, that sounds great. Forgive my ignorance. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the form a little more? I'm not sure that I, I'm not familiar with it in a little more detail. I, it's it's the it stands for the uh, free financial the, fr the federal free financial application, and um, it's uh, about 50 to 60 percent of Hope Scholars already fill it out, but there's about half that don't. And essentially, if you're applying for um, for financial aid, you have to fill this out. Tracy, you want to come up and kind of enlighten us on what the Georgia Student Finance Commission will do, and I think that will answer a lot of the questions. We met about it yesterday. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. As Representative Dollar spoke about, we are presently uh, allowing students to apply for HOPE and any other program that we administer through, through two ways. That is the, the free application for federal student aid, as Representative Dollar alluded to, or our own application. State law requires us to verify lawful presence in the United States of every student that gets a public benefit of us. And in order to do that, uh, we're moving to the FAFSA. And the FAFSA, as, as you heard, is already completed by about half of the kids, or 100,000 or so. State law presently requires that we would do this every year, uh, that we would verify lawful presence of every single student. And as Representative Dollar alluded to, that, that is already being performed by every post-secondary institution. We're already required by state law to verify citizenship in accordance with federal law, so it would be done twice. Okay. Anybody, 23 is uh, Represent Chairman Knight. In just clarification, I see what we're trying to do to verify the citizenship, but if you were a HOPE, I guess uh, you were you were applying for the HOPE, um, but otherwise you didn't need any financial assistance. Uh, going back to what Chairman Dollar had said, why all the invasive information about income and 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 you know if if you're not applying for any any kind of uh, financial assistance? Why are we? Is that is that going to be something that's mandatory whether you're you're applying for financial assistance or not? It is because of the nature of the free application for federal student aid. It's not information that we use. Tracy, we, pull that mic closer to your mouth. There thank you, you go. That thank you. It's it's not information that we use or collect for any purpose of determining eligibility for HOPE. Um, it is information that is included as part of the free application, and it must be included in order to submit the free application of federal student aid. Yeah, but, but, but what if I don't want federal student aid? What if there's students who don't want federal student aid? Why are they required to go through a lengthy and, and somewhat invasive process of income and you know, a lot of personal information. The, the benefit of us using the FAFSA, and, and to directly get to your question, is that the FAFSA uh, checks the Department of Homeland Security database and thus verifies citizenship. And as we were working through a solution to verifying lawful presence, we worked with audits and we worked with the uh, Attorney General's office and the FAFSA was an automated solution that can do that for us. And again, half of the students are already doing it. So, But, but, but I guess, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may, why are we requiring people who, who to, to give out or disclose personal confidential information if they are not seeking any other financial aid? I mean, is there a way to exempt them from that portion? Uh, I mean, how, how does what you make? It, it, again, that information is not used by us. Leg Council, have you got any anything you can highlight us with on that matter? You probably need to come to Mike One over there, Mike and Thirteen. While we're doing that, Chairman Knight, I was asking these very same questions you're asking now, and uh, for for a whole host of reasons, this was just the form that <clears throat> that they chose to use, and um, in what what we're trying to do now is to um, basically streamline the process. So that uh, so that Georgia Student Finance does not have to basically collect that information, um, if that answers your question. 
because I don't think that they weren't trying, I don't believe that they were trying to gather the financial information, but they had to use a federally approved list, a federally approved document, and this was the one that they chose. I guess the thought being that half the students were already filling it out. Like I said, it automatically checked with Homeland Security and it approved or it accomplished all the things that they needed to accomplish. That's why we're here now is we're trying to, again, streamline the process so that that doesn't have to take place. All you're trying to do is eliminate duplication from your constituent, right? One going to the University of Georgia, one going to Kennesaw State. We're trying to go back to the way it was. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. More questions. Who's 25? Okay. I'm second center on the bill, so I shouldn't have any questions, but I guess. Thank you for your support there. Did you read? Did you read the caption? I did. I read. I read every word of this lengthy bill before I signed it. Following Representative Knight's line of questioning. So just to make sure I'm completely, completely clear, the Georgia Student Finance Commission has elected or I don't know if it was your or the Board of Regents. I'm not sure who made this decision to use FAFSA as the mechanism by which to run every single student through SAVE. Is that the SAVE program, which verifies benefit eligibility? I'll let Mr. Ireland explain, I guess, the strategy for this form. But I think what you're going to find is that dealing with the volume and, you know, the X number of Joneses, the X number of William Smiths, they, with email, phone, with email, regular mail, walk in, it was collecting X number of signed sworn affidavits and another form proved to be logistically, I think, impossible. And I think that's how they arrived at this form. But I'll let him expand on that a little bit more. Thank you, Representative Veller. When we worked with the Attorney General's Office to find a workable solution to collecting those 200,000 affidavits, the FAFSA was the solution that we came up with. As Representative Dollar alluded to, we have 30,000 Smiths and 20,000 Joneses on our system. When someone goes into driver services to submit one of these affidavits, they walk into a physical location and they hand it to somebody and they swear it out in front of them. We don't have that luxury. We are located in one place and we have 200,000 students from all four corners of the state that would have to submit one of those to us every year. So the two options available to us were either the sworn affidavit or the free application for federal student aid. If I may, Mr. Chairman. I thought you were finished. I'm sorry. We're actually, I think, going to be making some tweaks to that law that's only going to require it be done one time this year and not the annual submittal of the affidavit. And it just seems to me that there's got to be a better way than requiring tens of thousands of parents to fill this application out, which is a lot of personal financial information purely for the purpose of running them through the SAVE program. I mean, there's, I mean, the Secretary of State's office is dealing with this through professional licensure and they deal with just as many applications as volume wise as you're talking about. And I've heard from two or three constituents about this as their kids were going off to college last year. So I'm going to encourage y'all to really, let's really put our heads together and see if we can come up with a better way than using this form because it seems overly intrusive and an overreach by the state government requiring the filling out of this form and it's particularly the nature of the information that you have to put on it. I think Ms. Gammage from the Technical College wants to say something. So Ms. Gammage, you want to say what you need to say? I think I can provide a little insight on why the Technical College is a lot of my colleagues. If you're talking to the microphone, please. Require the students to fill this form out because many of my students are economically disadvantaged and they qualify for Pell funding. I mean, and so we get federal funding through the Technical College is based on the number of Pell recipients. So that's the main reason I think that a lot of my colleges rely on this form. 
And I understand. I understand when the kids are going to they have to fill it out for financial aid reasons. I mean, that's that's the purpose of the form. But I'm concerned about the large number of people that are being required to fill this form out that aren't applying for any financial aid or, or grants of any of any kind. Because it, it sounds to me like it's purely being used um, as a means by which to to, to verify lawful presence, uh, and it seems like an awful burdensome way to do do that. Yeah, so. and it may be a little different for the university system, but the majority of my students are. Um, as I said, they qualify for Pell funding. And, and, and I think and I don't some have a of them don't even that. realize it, and maybe that's why my colleges encourage them to fill the form out, is they don't, they they may or may not know they qualify for right. Pell. And, and I mean, we, it, I, I'm just really concerned, the, the, the number cited earlier was about 50% of, of, of folks are filling this out already. I don't have a problem with that, I mean, because there's a, there's a legitimate reason for filling the form out. I'm talking about the half of the people that wouldn't otherwise fill this form yeah. out um, that are being required to do purely to run them through the safe uh, yeah the, the um, safe system Amanda seals with the University System of Georgia and I think what the the bill 324 is trying to accomplish what you're saying without this they do have to fill out the FAFSA well, they don't have to the Board of Regents has decided well, no, this is the mechanism we, by which we're it's going. not really a decision that to, to say that's the one you have to go through, like the technical college system. Our students do go through the federal um, grant system for Pell Grants, other financial aid on the federal level. And so it does background check them that way. If you were to say, I can pay for college, except I'm going for the HOPE, until the law changed recently, they didn't have to fill out the FAFSA. So if this passes, then I think it accomplishes what you're trying to do is to make sure that the Georgia Student Finance Commission doesn't have that huge application. Right, right. Uh, but there's nothing in our law, the laws that we've passed in this area over the last five or six years that requires requires the use of FAFSA to run the student. It's just the mechanism right. that's been selected. So, I, And I understand right. the goal here is to make it easier so so to, to facilitate moving away from 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 that mechanism but uh, and I guess that's what I'd like to see happen so I appreciate the author's efforts in that regard um, I, I I guess I, I I disagree with the mechanism that was chosen um, but hopefully we're moving away from it okay we got a little Christmas tree here so uh, represent Gardner I just want to make sure that I understand what this bill does representative dollar instead of having a standardized FAFSA form, which is unnecessary for the HOPE, it allows either the FAFSA or the simplified lawful eligibility form to be used? What it would essentially go back to is it would go back to the process that is currently being undertaken today as you and I speak, and that is the very simple online homegrown form that the Georgia Student Finance Commission requires HOPE. If you if you filed out a FAFSA form, though, would that would that qualify you then? Um, I, Tracy, I think that they would still be required to fill out the. So if you f fill out the FAFSA form, you have to fill out another form. No, ma'am. Okay, so there's not you're not requiring those students to do two things. Correct. And are we eliminating that you have to do it every year? Under present law, they would have to complete it every year. And we can't fix that with this bill. Yes, we still solve it. No, if I can, that 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 goes to the overall state law. That we're, we are we actually will have a bill, an opportunity for you to do just that later this session. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate. Representative Mabry, you still have a question? No, I'll wait. Okay. And Representative Watson. Thank you, Chairman, and. Uh, I will tell you, the anecdote is that uh, I, I have two sons in uh, in college, University of Georgia, Zell Miller and Hope Scholar, and we, we'd never filled out those in the past. And I have an 11th grader that came home the other day with his mother, who was not real happy. Mm -hmm. Mo mother wasn't real happy about having to fill out forms that, that where we were required to answer questions, you know, which I, I agree with are confidential. Um, and and you know she my wife wasn't real happy with me with the legislation that we apparently passed and now we're having to do this um, you know for the 50 percent of the people who don't have to fill out those forms 
and, I, and I'm one of the 50%, um, you know, I, I'm having a concern over this. Uh, it seems like there sh should be a, another mechanism or another way to get that, the information that we want. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I just, is, is there, obviously this has been researched, I guess there, this is more comment than question. Uh, are there other uh, Why don't you let, thing? Chairman Dodd, why don't you let Tracy come up and address this where we, I think it's, y'all making it more complicated than it really is. Tracy, you need to. I appreciate the question, and yes, sir, we, we've spent the better part of the last year working with the Department of Audits as well as the AG to try to come to a solution other than collecting those affidavits. And the FAFSA was the recommended solution out of that. Mr. Comments, this is more simple than it is. But I want to make sure, what my understanding is, is that we're going to this mechanism, this FAFSA form, and it's going to be required of all folks, right? Yes, sir. Every, every year. And, but and the student, Georgia Student Finance Commission is doing it themselves. Isn't that correct, Tracy? What? Uh, under what? I'm, I'm not sure I follow the question, sir. I thought you had rules and regs already in place that you did this on a per-student basis. Isn't that's, that correct? That's correct. Right now, under okay. Georgia law, every student is required to be a citizen in accordance with federal law, which is the same requirement that presently exists on the university system and TCSG. Okay. But... but in order, I think the mechanism, we're trying to get to a mechanism that will help us verify citizenship, right? No. No, we have that, sir. Then where does this FAFSA sit in? My understanding of the conversation is that this FAFSA is a way to verify this. I think that's rule and regulation you have now, correct? That is, that is correct. And that they is circumvent the laws that we pass. In, 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 order for us, in order for the commission to be in compliance with Georgia lawful presence laws, the FAFSA form is required now so that citizenship can be verified positively on every student okay so that that's current law before this it is current rule current rule no it's law i'm sorry I'm but the, the uh, chairman yeah when we passed this bill in, in 10 we obligate we we basically obligated them to 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 do this due diligence to 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 verify. yes but they had the capability to check with the universities and therefore not do a duplication essentially and that's we're trying to eliminate this duplication a, a duplication each year isn't that correct a duplication up front and every okay. year because they can they can communicate directly which is in contract with the universities they can say is john smith a legal resident they can say yes okay then he gets hope scholarship and that's that's what we do now and that's what we're trying to get back to because um, we when we exempted the Board of Regents University System and Technical Colleges because they fell under this federal law, we did not we did not exempt uh, Georgia Student Finance Commission. So this this would just exempt them, and they can communicate with the universities. And there's no change in the process as to what happens now. Okay, everybody understand. <laughs> Representative Ramsey, are you good? Okay. Go ahead. I, I, I move uh, that we uh, recommend do pass to House Bill 324 LC 41 0054. Okay, I got a motion. Did I hear a second? Second. Okay, got a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, like sign. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Okay, that com completes the meeting and. Um, Anybody else have anything they want to ask or say? All right, thank you. Thank you for attending.